How you doing guys, welcome to another video. This is topic six, chemical kinetics, and the first one is what is chemical kinetics? Let's go. Topic 6.1, what is chemical kinetics? We look at collision theory, and then we need to talk about the units of reaction rate. The IB understandings talk about what we kind of need for a reaction to occur. They also describe how we express the rate of a reaction, and then we need to define activation energy. We also need to describe the kinetic molecular theory in terms of its average kinetic energy, which is proportional to Kelvin temperature. So in any process where chemical manufacturers are manufacturing something, we're always looking to maximize the rate of reaction. The faster we can produce something, the better. To understand how we can speed up or slow down a reaction, we need to know what kind of energy changes take place. So in a reaction, firstly, the molecules must collide, they must physically meet. And then once they meet, they have to overcome this rule that they have enough energy to break the bonds in the reactants. So we have to have the collision occurring with enough energy to break the bonds in the reactants. And not all of the collisions are successful. A large number of collisions will occur and no reaction will take place. Now the reaction rate primarily depends upon two factors temperature and then the number of collisions. If we can increase the number of collisions, we're going to increase the chance of a successful collision. So we have this diagram on the right hand side, which is called a Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. And it shows the average kinetic energy of the particles and also relative to the Kelvin temperature. Now the kinetic energy is the energy of movement. So if we have a look at this red curve at 293 Kelvin, we can see that it's got a hump sort of at the left of the curve and the top of that hump we would describe as being the average kinetic energy. So the average kinetic energy of a sample of molecules at 293 Kelvin is about that location. But if we start to increase the temperature of the same sample of particles, we start to shift that graph to the right. So now we've got more particles with a greater amount of kinetic energy, proportional to the Kelvin temperature, because the Kelvin temperature has increased. So we've got more particles with more kinetic energy. Sure, we still have some that are going very slowly, and we have some that are going super fast. If we have a look at the collisions, the way we can maximize the number of collisions could be with the pressure of a vessel. If we can shorten or take away the space between the molecules, we're going to have an increased number of collisions. So if we have high pressure systems, that means that there's a lot of collisions occurring at a certain time. If we have a low pressure vessel, that means that the particles are spaced far apart. There's lots of empty space between them. So we're not going to have as many collisions. So for a chemical reaction to occur, the particles involved must first collide, and then secondly, they have to have sufficient energy to overcome the activation energy. The greater the number of successful collisions between reactant particles, the greater the rate of reaction. So here's a little bit of recall. What is the definition of activation energy? This is from topic five. So remember the activation energy is the minimum amount of energy required to break the bonds in the reactants and initiate the reaction. There's a couple of key words there. You must say the minimum amount of energy. We could have more, but we certainly can't have less. So the minimum amount of energy required to break the bonds, and we need to break bonds in the reactants. Bond breaking is an endothermic process, so we have to break the bonds in the reactants to initiate the reaction to form the products. So the definition of activation energy, the minimum amount of energy required to break the bonds in the reactants and initiate a reaction. That's got to be automatic. It will certainly come up. So this can help us describe why all reactions aren't explosive. Well, because in most chemical reactions, the collisions involved have less energy than the activation energy. So they simply just collide and then move off. The rate of a reaction also depends upon the proportion of successful collisions. And the orientation of those collisions is very important. So if we have a series of reactions, there might be only one orientation where a successful reaction will occur. In this case, with that white hydrogen hitting the double bond. That's the only successful collision, and this is just an animation. 
all of the other orientations would result in an unsuccessful collision. So that means the particles will just collide and then bounce off, looking and bouncing and colliding until a successful collision occurs. So what conditions do we need for a successful reaction? Well, the first thing that has to happen is the particles must collide. The second thing that must occur is that they must collide with enough energy to overcome the activation energy to break the bonds in the reactant. So the energy has to be greater than or equal to the activation energy. The third thing is that they have to collide in the correct orientation. So there's quite a few requirements for a successful collision and all of these need to be overcome for the reaction to occur. That's why a lot of, re a lot of collisions are not successful and if we can increase the probability of a successful reaction, we're going to get a faster reaction rate. So the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution shows the distribution of kinetic energy when it's proportional to the Kelvin temperature. And we can see below that if we have something with a fairly high activation energy, the Maxwell-Boltzmann describes that a large proportion of the molecules don't have enough energy to overcome the activation energy. There's only a small proportion which can collide and then react to form the products. So the average kinetic energy is always at the top of the peak and on average a large number of the particles would not be able to collide and form a reaction. Only a small number would be able to. But if we start to increase the temperature then we can start to shift that graph to the right. Now the activation energy will stay the same, it's the same reaction. And what we're looking for is to increase the proportion of molecules which are above the activation energy. Because right now we have a lot that aren't above the activation energy and they won't form a successful collision. So if I increase the temperature by 10 degrees, my drawing is really bad and I do apologize. It's gonna shift that graph to the right. So the average kinetic energy will move to the right. We'll have a greater proportion of molecules which will have more energy than the activation energy, and we should see that by the area under the graph. So here's my poor drawing. I've shifted that graph to the right a little bit, and then my activation energy is still the same, but I could, you can see here that, in my poor drawing, that I have a greater number of particles with energy above the activation energy. So the graph has shifted to the right. We now have more particles that are able to successfully collide, and then break the bonds in the reactants to form the products. And then we have a smaller amount that still have the average kinetic energy and still have very small amounts of energy, but we do have more that are able to react. So the average kinetic energy of the particles is greater because we've increased the Kelvin temperature, but the main thing is we've got more particles that are above the activation energy. An important industrial process is known as the harbour process, and that's the manufacture of ammonia. Now, ammonia can be manufactured from nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas to form ammonia, but if the catalyst is not employed, it takes a lot of energy to break the bonds in the reactants. So without a catalyst, the harbour process needs requires temperature of 3000 degrees. That's because there are strong bonds between nitrogen and hydrogen. Once we get this reaction initiated, it's an exothermic reaction, so it releases energy. So if we have a look at our energy profile diagram, our energy profile diagram shows a really large activation energy. If we don't have the catalyst, we need to have temperatures of about 3000 degrees, so that means that we have a very high activation energy. So our activation energy, very, very large because of the strong bonds in the nitrogen and hydrogen. Now when we employ a catalyst, the catalyst lowers the activation energy. So we have a much lower activation energy, which means a lot more of the particles will now have energy that's above that activation energy and will get a faster reaction rate. The catalyst does not change the delta H, the delta H remains the same. It would still be negative 91 kilojoules per mole. The catalyst only affects the activation energy. A catalyst will only increase the rate of reaction by lowering the activation energy and it's, per it's not permanently changed.
So here's our Maxwell Boltzmann distribution with our activation energy with no catalyst. Now if we add in our catalyst, we don't shift the graph this time, we've just lowered the activation energy. So the activation energy is lowered, which means we have a greater number of particles with energy above the activation energy. The area under that graph is significantly increased, which means we would have a much faster reaction rate with a catalyst than without a catalyst. Okay, the rate of reaction is defined as the change in the amount of reactants or loss of reactants or the gain of products per unit time. And the unit time is a very important part of this definition. So the rate can be worked out is the amount of a reactant at time two, take away the amount of reactant at time one, divided by the time. So we have that as the change in concentration of a reactant over the change in time. Now, if we're looking at units, if our concentration is mole per dm3 and our time is seconds, then our units for the rate would be mole per dm3 s to the minus one, the change in concentration per second. If we were looking at grams, we might be measuring something in grams and minutes, our reaction rate would be grams per minute, the, the unit and then the time. If we're looking at something changing in volume, we might have centimeters cubed per second. So we'd be measuring the volume every second and we would be working out our reaction rate. The reaction rate is the change in something over the time. Okay, topic 6.1, some top tips. Know the two definitions, know the activation energy definition and know the rate of reaction definition. And remember that the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution is proportional to the Kelvin temperature. Thanks for watching guys, don't forget, drop a like on the video, subscribe for more, and I'll see you next time.